Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. So they know of him, of some religious leader, some guy who started something called Christianity, but he's still unknown. And there's that time we steps over from, he is Christ, he is in the boat with me, and I'll never get kicked out. That's the joy of Jesus Christ. And I love that about that, and how that we can continue to know who Christ is. Let's go to verse 21. It says here, so they were willing to receive him into the boat. I want to stop there for a moment. If you have your Bible, hold your place here and go to the book of Matthew. I want to just briefly go back because something else occurred that John chose not to tell us about here, but I believe is critical to understanding what are we afraid of. And it's going to be where Peter fits into all of this because he is in the same event. He's just left out of the story in John, but it's very much in Matthew chapter 14. Look in verse 28. So you got this problem going on. Verse 27, it is I, don't be afraid. Jesus just said that. Matthew decided to record what John didn't. So verse 28 says this. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, I know that Peter gets kicked around an awful lot. And I would wish we wouldn't do that as much because none of the other guys said, Lord, if it's really you, call me to come to you out into the water. Now, in the middle of a storm with chaos and the blackness of night, you're seeing a wispy figure out there who's claiming to be Jesus. And Peter says, if it's really you, ask me to walk on this boisterous water in the middle of the Sea of Galilee to you. To me, that statement alone shows that he's either absolutely nuts or there's some degree of faith in him. Well, let's go a little bit further. And so the Lord said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water and he came toward Jesus. Now, that's where some of you might be. You might have come to the point where you recognize that is the Lord now. Jesus says, come, even in the midst of the storm, get out even of the safety of your boat, of your little security blanket, And I want you to actually get deeper into this storm. And I want you to feel this without any crutch under you other than just my word that says, come. And so he came, but he became frightened and he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. What I thought was interesting, Peter didn't say, let me swim back to the boat. Hey, guys, help me. He didn't do that. He looked to the same Lord that called him to go out into the water. And when he was sinking, he still went to the source that basically was abandoning him in his own mind. And he still said, save me. So even in your little bit of faith, and you're going under right now, and you're now saying, God told me to get in the boat. He told me to go ahead, get out of the boat now. And now I'm out of the boat. I've done everything he wanted me to do, and I'm still sinking. It wasn't because the waves got any worse. It was only because he got his eyes off the Lord. And maybe right now, if that's where you are, go back to putting your eyes on the Lord. And maybe all you can do right now is to say, oh, God, save me. The Lord loves that kind of desperate prayer. Let's go back to the passage. The Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus, I love that, underline it, immediately, immediately. He didn't do it ahead of time, and you'd think sometimes the Lord is watching Peter go down, and he said, oh, I better help this guy. You know, he's going to go down. I better go get him. No, Jesus didn't. Jesus didn't run after Peter. He waited until he cried out. And when he cried out, then he helped him. Maybe some of you are waiting for the Lord to take care of your problems right now when you need to cry out unto the Lord, Lord, help me. And then he will. He stretched out his hand and he took hold of him and he said, Hey, atta boy, Pete, you did a good job. You got out of the boat. You yelled after me. You got your eyes back on me. I'll take you back to the boat. No, what did he do with Peter? He said, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, that's when the wind stopped. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. He did not stop the problem until it was ready until he got his eyes on the Lord and he looked out to the Lord. Now, here's what I'd like to say to some of you right now. I think the Lord is gracious enough to look at the faith that you have and say, at a boy, at a girl, you've stretched your faith. You're, you're coming on this journey. You're doing better. But I think right now, he also would like to say, oh, ye of little faith, because he wants to stretch you a little bit more. It goes back to the sermon last week, that test of trust. What right now is he testing your trust in him in? I don't know what it is. I can't even imagine what it is. But I believe with all my heart it's happening right now in your life. So let's go back here to the book of John, John chapter 6. I just wanted you to see what happened. 
Jesus performed um, four miracles kind of wrapped up around here. I think he performed, you know, gobs of miracles in this. In the Gospel of John, you're going to find that this is the fifth miracle. The first one is water and wine. The second one was when the um, little boy was healed. Uh, the third one was when the paralytic man was healed. The fourth one was when he fed the 5,000 plus. This is the fifth one right here. So this is the fifth mir- big miracle that's here. But I think there's some sub-miracles going on. The first one is Jesus walking on the water. We already covered that. Number two, Peter was walking on the water. We've already covered that. The third one is the storm stopped, which I think itself is letting you know again God is large and in charge. And the fourth one, if you go back to the passage, they arrived to the other side. Go back to John, and it says here, so neat. Is there a frightened? It is I. Don't be afraid. Immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Now, you read that, and we go over it so fast. They were willing to receive them into the boat, into their life, into their situation. I love that. That'll preach. Don't have time. And immediately, right then, it wasn't like a speedboat got them there. It was kind of like another sub-miracle. They're in the middle of the storm. The storm stops. The boat's on the other side. And underline this part, to which they were going. I need to talk about that to which they were going. He didn't bring them back to safety. He didn't bring them somewhere to the side. He kept them going in the course that he had directed them to go. And so I want you to know, God will direct you to a course. You'll know where God wants you to go. But in the midst of that, there are going to be some horrific storms to stretch your faith. But not just that. It's not just about you being stronger in faith. It's about you being stronger in faith in God. So God gets the glory and he's still going to get you to where you need to go. So when I look at this, there's God all over this. I look here when he stopped the storm. That tells me that he is omnipotent over all of his creation. When I see Peter here stumbling and falling, I still see a God who is strong enough to uphold our faith when it's weak. When I see the fact that that he got them to where they needed to go, I see a God who's so powerful that he'll still get us to the objectives that God has called us to. And so don't give up on those things. Don't turn around. Don't stop. God will get you there. But it all has to be, watch this, in his strength, and often in his timing, and he will do that every single time, and I think that's so beautiful. So what does he do in all of this? Well, there's a couple of truths. First of all, Jesus causes us to face our fears. So right now, are you in a fearful situation? The normal thing to do is called fright and flight. You're frightful of something, so you're going to flee that thing. So it's fright and flight. We normally want to do that. Most all of us do that. And the Lord says, no, I do not want you to flee your fears, because if you do, you will not see me strong in those fears. One thing he didn't expect out of them, and that's too light of a word, he would not want out of them, is for them to have committed suicide, just go overboard and die. And I don't think any of you are there, but just in case you're listening, and this is going worldwide, this message, if you're there, teenagers commit suicide more than anyone else. Whatever you're going through right now, teenagers that might be listening, I want you to know, do not, do not end your life. If you're harming your body and cutting yourself, stop it. No matter how much pain you're in, the pain you cause your body so that you reflect on that pain so it becomes greater than your emotional pain of your problem in life, I want you, is not a solution. In fact, it will complicate what you're doing. Please stop it. Please seek help from a biblical counselor, a mature person of the same sex who can come alongside you and give you the word. Well, let me get back to this right now. So you need to face your fears. The second is that Jesus moves into our fears. I really love that. Jesus didn't stay on the, on the shore and say, okay, seize me still. He came right into that. I love this because that means whatever you're going through right now, yes, we, you know, Jesus in heaven is holy throne, but Jesus is everywhere present. The Bible also says Christ in you, the hope of glory. So he's in heaven. He's everywhere. He's in you. So wherever you are, wherever you go with your storm, I want you to know he's right there. You military guys, you might have some issues right now. Those of you that have been deployed, you know the issues really begin there and there's so much none of us can even ever imagine what it is. The Lord is with you through all of that. He is in your fears. Now watch this. This is so cool. Daniel, when uh, in the Old Testament, Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. When he got into the lion's den, it was pretty cushy. I mean, I know, and all that jazz. But once he got in there, boom, the mouths of the lions were stilled, and he slept sweetly all night. My belief, I do. Come on out of there. Everybody was fine. Everybody loved it. Everybody was hugging the cats and all that. The next, he had three buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. My shack, your shack, and a bungalow. Those three guys now, they were now because they were worshiping God and all of that, they took those guys with the soldiers that brought them to a fiery pit that they fired up so hot that the, even the guys that were going to chuck them into that fire caught fire themselves and died. So these three guys either fell in, stumbled in, or jumped into this fire thinking that they probably would die, not knowing what the outcome would be. And when they got there, watch this. It said, quoting, that 
I thought we threw three in there, but I see the fourth one like the Son of Man. Some call it an angel. I tend to think that it was Jesus Christ himself as a Christophany in there. In any case, here's what did not happen. There was no eternal fire extinguisher. That fire was just as raging. When they came out of it, the fire was just as hot. The difference was when they came out of that fire, Jesus was with them. They had their confidence in that fire in God. They didn't even smell a smoke. So whatever you are right now, you can learn from that hot fire that you might be in, but you don't have to let it affect you. You don't have to walk away as a victim of what happened to me. Because I want you to know God permitted it, prescribed it. He didn't bring sin into your life, but sin is there and he knows it. He's going to take that sin and he's going to turn around and make beauty out of those ashes. If you let him, put him first. So he moves into our fears. Number three, trust him with your fears. Trust him with your fears. I just put in my margin, in my notes, he's large and in charge. I say that all the time, but never forget it. He's large and in charge. Number four, Jesus moves away from our fears in the sense that once the lessons have been learned or at least as much as he wants us to either hear or know or to understand, once that truth has been given to us in his timing, he will move us to the next area. So again, he moves us to where we need to be. May I just throw in a little side note right here? It's very easy for us when we go through these problems that we begin to compare our scar with someone else's scar. And we try to do a one-upsman. Oh, you got that? Well, you got to hear about mine. And all. It's not about who has what scars when because every scar, that every issue that we have, God permitted it to come into our life to make us stronger. And different scars for different folks, different strokes for different folks, maybe different pokes for different strokes for different folks, for you and me. So just kind of keep that in mind. Let me give you this here. Uh, you have it in your outline very easy. You don't have to fill in anything here. But there's two pictures I think this miracle Jesus Christ was doing subliminally, but I think preparing us for, particularly these guys. Now, he spoke to the crowds, of course, but he also was trying to raise up the next generation, or maybe we could call it the first generation of Christian leaders. And so he knew he was separated from them. We already studied that. And they're alone in these problems right here. He's preparing them for the time. Watch this. When he knew he would then go to the cross and some of them followed from a distance, some followed a little closer, some were real close, but in any case, they all abandoned him at the last minute and they were all alone for at least three days not seeing Jesus, some a little bit longer until he began to reveal himself to them. In any case, Jesus wasn't there physically at that time and he was preparing. Watch this, this is important. He told them this was going to happen and so he wanted them to learn that sometimes even though you do not see me, you have to remember my promises. So you may not feel his presence. You might not have that ooey-gooey feeling. I want you to know, just hang on to his promises. Now, you might know he makes promises and he's larger than a charge, can keep his promises, etc. But if you don't know his promises, how will you ever have the strength and the comfort? That's why you've got to desperately be in this book right here. Slow your life down. Look over the things that you're involved in, especially with your kids. So that you have the time, you make the time to get into the Word. And I don't mean just read through in the year. I'm talking about you abide in this book right here. Model it as you're mentoring it to your kids. So the second picture, I think, is a little bit more apropos to us. And that is, we know that Jesus Christ, we talked about the time he went for the cross, the tomb, he rose again, that little separation. Now let's talk about not the resurrection. Let's talk about the ascension. He leaves the earth entirely and he's in heaven right now. His job primarily in heaven. We've covered this already, folks. Get the notes. He's interceding for us. What does that mean? What is he doing for us right now while we're alive here in Honolulu in heaven? Okay, this is not theology stuff in the Bible only. He's in heaven right now for you in this room doing something right now while we're in here for you. Okay, that's happening in heaven. We know he's coming back again, but there are those times that we might feel that he is still not there. And my emphasis again strongly is do not base on his, don't, don't base your confidence in his location in your life or even action in your life. And if you, if you feel like he's there or not, it cannot be based on feeling. It has got to be based on the unadulterated, inerrant word of God where Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you so you can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. That's quiz number one. Some of you are dying now. What about quiz number two? Is he going to give you that? We had a discussion with a couple of the guys this morning in the office, some of the pastors. And uh, here's my challenge. <clears throat> quiz number two is very critical. 
is very critical because in this passage, and I'm not going to preach it now, I just want to get you ready to be back here next week and bring your friends. There's a section in there where the guys say, what can we do that we can work the works of God so we can have eternal life? And the reason that is so critical is because there are, are religious people all over the globe that are trying to do certain works to have eternal life or get to the happy hunting ground or, the, or whatever the sweet wine by is, whatever they believe. And they're, they're trying to do that. And I want to answer, what is the work that God wants us to do to go to heaven? I need to answer that. But also, since I'm going to push this into next week's message that's already written, I'm going to try to blend the two together. It'll still be true exegetically, so you can relax, because all of it is just one verse after the other. But I'm also going to answer the question of this. If I trust Christ as my Savior, and I'm in His forever family, but I then sin, could I be cast out of His family? Could I somehow lose this wonderful eternal life relationship that I have with God? What could happen to me that would cause me, once I'm on my way to heaven, not to get my way to heaven any longer? What would stop God from letting me go to heaven before I get there? I need to answer that question. It is in this context because, again, it is about us. Yeah, God will take care of our problems and all of this. He's always right there. But remember, it's still about, is Jesus God or not? So I want you to come back next week, especially if you have your friends who do not know the Lord, and especially those who are still needing the assurance of their salvation. And I will not preach what I wanted to preach this morning on the second half of this, but I'll put it together with next week's message. If you all like me to do that, say amen. Okay. How many want me to go on? Didn't think so. All right. (laughs) But I would be doing a disservice to the Lord and to his word right now, so I want you to be very still. If this was a class full of boys and girls, little kids, here's what I'd tell them right now. I'd say, put your hands together, put them on your lap, lean forward, and look at me. Now, I'm not going to do that because you're not kids, but you get the point. You could hear all this about Jesus Christ, but I know that those hearing my voice today are only two groups of people, not men and women. The two groups are going to be those who know they're going to heaven by faith alone and those who do not. And for those who do not, here's what I want you to know. Jesus Christ perhaps has allowed a lot of junk to come into your life right now. I don't know. But I do know this. It wasn't to bring you down, to ruin your life, or to hinder you from future activities. What he has done is he's ringing a bell. Sovereignly. You could have been on any church. You could have been at any religious place. You could have been at the beach today or sitting home or sleeping this morning. But you're here because God wanted you to hear this. So sovereignly he's speaking to you. He's reminding you of all the stuff that's going on in your life right now because he wants to say this, I'm permitting it so that when I come to you, you'll turn and look to this strange guy. He knows you don't really know him yet, but he's going to reveal himself to you. And already he did today because you saw a bunch of guys that were in a real situation and Jesus really walked on the water, the first guy to water ski, so to speak. He did this because he is God. And he did this in Scripture and he brought it to you today because he loves you. He loves you now to bring you this message. He loved you then when he went to the cross before you were born. And if you do not trust Christ as your Savior, he says you will be lost, lost, lost. Please trust Christ as your Savior. You don't come to him by doing anything. These guys didn't row. They didn't row any harder. All they did was invite him into the boat. All you do is to invite him into your heart, into your life. And you do that by simply saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know I've done things wrong. I could never do enough good deeds to have my sins forgiven or to even have you in my life. And so right now, I am trusting in you as the one who died and rose again. That's how you invite him in. Jesus says, to as many as received him, that's invited him in, to as received him. To them gave he the right to become the children of God. And here's how you receive him. The rest of the verse says, to those who believe on his name. You want to receive him? Don't just say, Lord, I want to receive you. You say, Lord, I believe that you are the Lord. You died on the cross and I'm trusting you. I don't know a lot about you. I know you're not a ghost. I know you're not a mystery man. But there's a lot I don't know. But here's what I do know. I do believe that you are God and you did go to the cross. You paid my sin debt. and You're going to forgive me. And somehow, Lord, in your timing, you're going to calm my seas. Lord, I need you right now. Would you go to him? with every head bowed and every eye closed. In a few moments, we're going to pray, but I want to give you some undistracted time right now just with you and the Lord. Would you right now do what these guys did, like Peter? Oh, save me. Save me, Lord. I got out of the boat. I came to church. 
That was my first step towards you. I'm here today. I turned on the radio. I'm listening. I flipped on the, the internet site, this church, and I'm hearing this message. I, I got out of the boat like Peter did. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of coming towards you a little bit. I'm, I'm doing a little investigation. But now you're going to say, Lord, save me. Now, it's not so much a prayer. It's like saying, Lord, you're the only one who can save me. It's not my faith and my works. It's only you. Would you call upon the Lord right now and say, Lord, I'm trusting in you. In a sense, save me. I'd like to pray for you. Now, I'm not going to have you stand up or come forward. I don't want to embarrass you. I know right now you're very private, and that's fine. And Jesus knows that. And believing is in your heart, so it's not something to do outwardly. So you don't have to do a showy, flashy thing. But it's something you do inside. But I'm going to invite you, though, if you'd like for me to pray for you. I'm going to ask you to slip up your hand in a moment. Now, when you do that, I will not call upon you. I, I will not mention your name in my prayer. I will not describe you in my prayer. I'll just know that you want me to pray because you trust Christ. Now, remember, me praying for you will not save you. Raising your hand will not save you. Calling unto Jesus Christ as the Lord who died and rose again, that saves you. But now you're just letting me know that you're doing that today. In fact, that you did that just now. And you only do it once. Peter didn't have to say, save me, save me, save me. And then five minutes later, Lord, save me, save me, save me. It was once and for all. Boom. It's over. Done. Saved. Is there anyone here that trusted Christ as your Savior? You called upon the Lord to save you. You'd like for me to pray for you. Would you silently and with every head bowed and every eye closed, slip up your hand right now so I can see it. If today was the day you did that, put it up real high. May I see that? Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? I'd like you to get your little guest card out in a moment. And if you'll put your name, address, and phone number on there. And on the back it says, I trusted Christ. I want you to check that off. If some of you are saying, I've got a whole bunch more questions, I want you to put that down. Let us know. If you trust in Christ, I'm going to send you a booklet. I won't come to your house and bother you, but I'll send you a little booklet I've written called Now That You Believe. I want you to have it. Now, Christians, for you, you might very much be rejoicing for this one who's trusted Christ. But for right now, for just a moment, what about you? What are you afraid of? What are you going to do about it? What did you learn today? There's an awful lot of truth for you to assimilate. Get the, get the CD. If you can't afford it, don't worry about it. I'll give it to you. Listen to it on the radio. It'll probably be on the radio in about a month, but if you want to go to our website, it should be on here by the end of the week. Download the outline if you want to. It's fully. It's a full 11-page, 12-page outline, more than what you got today, but go through that. But how many of you would silently, without anyone looking at you right now, heads bowed and eyes closed, you'd like for me to pray for you? Because you've had some storms in your life and now you're recognizing that Jesus Christ is all a part of that and he's stretching your faith and you want to rejoice now because you know that he will calm the seas in his timing and so you're inviting him, in a sense, back into your life although he's never left. And you're saying, Lord, I thank you that you're in my fears right now and you won't let me go. I will not drown with you. Pastor, pray for me. This is a, a message where God spoke to me through his spirit and word. Pray for me. Would you slip up your hand right now? Put it up. I'd like to see your hand. Amen. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. It's so rich and so pure. and It's like a fresh, ice-cold drink of water on a hot day. And Father, we thank you that when we drink of you that we never really thirst again. We just know where to go to the well. We thank you. Thank you, Father, for the problems that we have because we know that in everything we're to give thanks for this is the will of God concerning us. And Father, we thank you that you love us too much to leave us in sin. And so those storms could get worse before they get better until we have our attention on you fully in a fully consecrated and surrendered way as a believer in Christ who has the power now to do so. And Father, for those that are going through some tough times, not because of any choice of their own, they've they've been abused and neglected and rejected. and, And Father, they're hurting deeply right now. And Father, we'll try to come alongside them, humanly speaking, and love on them. But Father, what they really need is not just Christian brothers and sisters. They need to experience the love of God that you will provide for them. So help them, Father, to plunge deeply into your word. And my confidence is in you, Holy Spirit, that you will comfort them. I pray for us as a church that we will be a church strong in you so that we can invite others so they too can know you. I pray that next week that this place will be filled with people that we've invited to hear that special message about you being Savior. 
and how that, Father, they can know for sure they have eternal life and it cannot be lost. What a gracious and loving Father we have. In your name we pray. Amen. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.